Welcome to The Teaching Curve, a podcast exploring the pedagogy of global politics and international studies, produced under the auspices of the Innovative Pedagogy Initiative of the International Studies Association and made available through ISA's Professional Resource Center. I'm Jamie Free, Associate Provost and Professor of Global Politics at Bridgewater College. Each episode of The Teaching Curve is a conversation with a thoughtful and engaged teacher of global politics. The goal is to celebrate and inspire pedagogical creativity by exploring ways that colleagues find to push the envelope of the pedagogical norms that too many of us implement without much forethought or even justification. The successes and failures of innovators who are willing to share their experiences help us all, whether we adopt their particular innovations or are simply encouraged to do more to make our approaches to teaching our own. Today's conversation is with Dr. Alex Cromwell, a professorial lecturer and the Associate Director of the Dean Scholars and Experiential Learning Program at the Elliott School of International Affairs at George Washington University in Washington, DC in the US. Today, we are talking about an International Studies Perspectives article he co-authored with Seiya Miyashiro entitled, Promoting Learning About Precarity and Resilience in War, Virtual Encounters Between Afghan and American Students in International Studies Courses. Our conversation explores the value of cross-cultural interactions for teaching students about their positions in the world and what it actually means to have empathy on a global scale. The logistics and common problems of integrating international video interactions into a global politics course and suggestions for how to improve that process now that online video interactions are more accessible and more normal. Alexander Cromwell, welcome to The Teaching Curve. Thanks very much for joining me today to talk about what I think is a really interesting article and your teaching and your approach to it in general. Thanks so much. Yeah, I'm very excited to be here. Um, I'm really excited that this podcast exists and then I get to be part of a conversation here. So thanks so much for inviting me. Wonderful. So the first question I always ask is to help people and the audience kind of position you in terms of your context to talk about where you are and how you are, what, what your teaching role is. And I find the best way to do that is to have you talk a little bit about who your students are. So can you tell us, me, tell everybody about your students? Sure, absolutely, yeah. So I'm currently based at the LA School of International Affairs uh, at George Washington University. So, you know, it's, it's in the heart of Washington, DC, right? I mean, I think it's big claim to fame is that, you know, from the LA School, like classroom windows, we can see the Washington Monument, you know, um, the State Department's right, right down the street um, and, and the White House just a couple blocks away. So there's this feeling when you're there of like, oh, here we are, we are in DC, we're, we're in a place where important decisions are happening, right? And so um, we have, you know, some really strong go-getter students who are really interested in the world and who really want to make an impact in the world and, and in global politics, right? Um, yeah, and so that's that's really the, the kind of environment and the ethos of the place. Um, so it's a really exciting place to be. Uh, at the undergraduate level, you know, we have, I mean, the, the big thing about the school drivers, we have, we have a huge number of students. We have about 3,000 students studying international affairs, about 2,000 at the undergraduate level, um, and also really relevant to our conversation. So before, so I've been at the LA school three and a half years, but before I came here, um, I was at American University at the School of International Service. You know, we did that very go-getter students as well who were very passionate about global politics and making an impact in the world and who were doing lots of internships in DC as well. Um, and similarly, right, has a similar number of students, a huge number of undergrads as well as grad students. When I was there, I taught a lot of cross-cultural communication, which of course we'll be talking more about in terms of the program that's relevant to the article, um, which is a course for freshmen, uh, uh, for all international studies students required to take it. And then I taught a number of peace and conflict courses there as well. I think that's a bit of the context, yeah. Um, so one of the reasons that I wanted to talk to you is this article that uh, came out in International Studies Perspectives uh, that you wrote with your co-author, um, mm -hmm. Saya Miyashira. Yeah, Saya Miyashira, yeah. Saya. And uh, it's an article that relates an experience that you had teaching this cross-cultural communications course um, and getting students in the United States connected with students and uh, in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. um, and, and just tell me a little bit, tell everybody a little bit about the setup, what the program was and, and how you came to create this learning opportunity for the students. Yeah, so, you know, I had been teaching um, cross-cultural communication for a while. And, you know, I'm in chatting with a colleague, I found out that they had, you know, facilitated this, um, 
these online interactions with students in Bahrain. And I remember thinking like, wow, that's that's what it's supposed to be, right? Because in cross-cultural communication, right, your whole goal is to help students think about the role of their own culture on how they see the world, right? And how, you know, uh, the, just the role of cultural values and interactions and how often those things are beneath the surface, right? And we don't recognize them. And so, you know, you could have them reflect on their own experiences, um, engaging across cultures as a way to get at that. And you can get them to think about like even engaging across like different cultures within the US context, right? Um, as ways to get at that. But I really wanted to facilitate something where they were having these interactions, right? An experiential kind of experience and then um, reflecting on it, right? Um, Cause we know that that's the way that students learn in the most meaningful way. So I kind of had this in the back of my mind and um, uh, I went to this State Department event for emerging young leaders, and I met this young woman from Afghanistan, um, and we really clicked. And she was, you know, she was at AUAF, the American University of Afghanistan. I was teaching at American University at the time, and I was like, you know, I'd love to connect Afghan students with my students. She was like, that's what I do. I do these kinds of dialogues. So we just had this really perfect kind of meeting and connection. Um, and, you know, and then we said, okay, let's do this thing, right? Let's let's bring Afghan students together uh, with, with my students. Um, and so that was kind of how it started, uh, you know, so she went and got permission from AUAF um, and I was, you know, I was teaching cross-cultural communication. So I was like, I'm just going to build this as, into my class, right? Um, and of course, at the time, right, at the time I met her, it was 2017 and then we did it in spring 2018. And this is, of course, pre-COVID, right? So that we didn't have, you know, we weren't all familiar with Zoom. It was kind of this thing of like, we did use Zoom, uh, but we had the free version. So after 45 minutes, it would cut off type thing, right? So, so we had, we had you know, a lot of things that we were kind of figuring out along the way, um, but that's how it started. And again, and again, there was, you know, two major purposes. One was to really faci facilitate these, you know, these cross-cultural interactions where students on both sides were learning from each other, learning about, you know, what, what are the, some of the basic cultural values and practices? What's, what does daily life look like? What do people believe and why do they believe it? Um, and of course, connecting it to the themes of the course um, more generally. Um, and so the way, I, the big question, of course, is, okay, how best do we do this, right? Um, and so, uh, I, my thought was, okay, you know, I've seen in the, one of the things I've read in the literature, you know, as someone who focuses a lot on intergroup dialogues in my own research, right? Um, something that I read, there's a great article that, uh, by Schroeder and Risen that talks about, you know, uh, they looked at Seeds of Peace, which brings together Jewish and, you know, and Palestinian youth. And they found that, you know, a, a year later, the most, uh, important factor that determined whether or not youth had trust for the other group and had more positive views was if they had at least one friend on the other side, right? So that was the big thing. And then, of course, Pettigrew talks extensively about the importance of friendship potential in contact interactions, right? And also, I'd read some stuff, you know, about the Israeli-Palestinian context and how the, in integrated schools, you know, students would become friends across difference, but they wouldn't actually hang out outside of the school environment, which then made it so they didn't develop these close relationships or as close as they could be. So, I, so with all that in mind, I was really thinking about, okay, how do we make this, you know, these, these interactions meaningful? Um, and so we came up with this idea of, okay, let's pair them. We'll have, we'll have, you know, Afghans and, and Americans and we'll partner them up, right? And so we had a bunch of pairs and some groups of three and we said, okay, this is your partner. Um, you know, outside of class time, you're gonna have at least three one-on-one -on -one calls with them. Um, there's going to be deadlines by which you have to have it done and then write a reflection paper. Um, and, and these we'll were have... video calls, right? They, yeah. they were well, ideally, right? The idea, yeah. the idea was on your own time, you'll have video calls. Of course, you know, this was the, the, the overall, the general plan. What actually happened was, you know, because of technological difficulties, mm -hmm. right. Um, and to the time difference and things like that, sometimes students, you know, would just, would just do audio. Some you know sometimes they would do um, even have to resort to like recording like uh, audio messages back and forth, and in the worst times you sometimes it ended up just being text based communication right because some of yeah. the students in Afghanistan and I and I re and I recognize this myself because I did some interviews with them pre pre and post interviews with the Afghan students too and the technology was very difficult I mean you know, you know just a couple of times when I ask a question there's a long gap you know whatever right so so of course students were dealing with that too so that was a huge challenge but the idea was <laughs> to have these kind of video one-on-one -on -one video calls um so that and so yeah so the three one-on-one -on -one calls and then and then um you know then we had group calls where basically we had okay in each group there will be eight afghan students eight american students and then you know i was lucky enough to have 
two TAs and a research assistant. And so Saya was one of the TAs in the class, right? And so, you know, worked with me and designing this on implementing it. And then we continue to continue to be my TA in various other classes. So she's someone who I, you know, have learned a lot from and is really thinks very uh, critically about pedagogy. So I was really grateful for her to work with me on this project. And unfortunately she couldn't join the conversation today, but that's a bit of the structure of the program. And then students had to write, um, you know, again, reflection papers, uh, reflecting on each individual conversation. And then we did group dialogues. And then of course we did, you know, pre and post kind of surveys and interviews um, just to kind of see the impact of the program. And, and, and I was really hoping that it was going to have this impact. Right. And so I thought I really want to collect data to make sure that it's having the impact. And I honestly, you know, there's not that much research on virtual encounters, right? There's some, um, um, you know, and it, it generally shows that it does, that these encounters do reduce prejudice in the same way that in-person contact does. Right. But, you know, and, um, so I, I was thinking like, you know, let's, let's really like, let's really see if this can work, you know? Um, and, and I think, you know, the reason why I was so excited about doing Afghanistan, right. You know, I'd done my research in Pakistan and, and I just felt like Americans really don't understand Afghanistan. Mm. Right. And I really wanted them to have a deeper understanding of, you know, what do Afghans, how do Afghans think and what are their experiences like? Mm -hmm. And on, you know, on the Afghan side, you know, there was a lot of interest and desire in strengthening English skills and, yep. and having this ability, you know, and of course the Afghan students in this program, they got, you know, they got certificates and things like that, but they weren't getting course credit, right? So it really was just a testament to their kind of passion or desire and interest to, to do this thing, right? Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, one of the things that I think since you did this there's been and i've been watching slowly this expansion of the idea of cooperative online international learning the coil idea um i think this is an, a very early example of some things that are starting to become partly because of technology and and people getting used to being on zoom a much more prevalent thing but mm -hmm. there are a lot of as you say challenges about trying to, to tech both technology time zone stuff mm -hmm. uh, being able to help get across language barriers and this is in a, a country one of the things that I like about this is this is a country that Americans uh, and and I know you're dealing with international studies majors but even most Americans would at least know that Afghanistan is a country that the United States has been involved in and that we've had this relationship uh, in many ways that, that stretched over decades that um, it's different from maybe setting up a, a interaction with students from Gabon, you know, where people are like, I don't know what the hell that is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, and, that, and that, that led to a few very interesting findings, right? So as you're saying, right, the students at AU, you know, very similar to my students at UW, right, are generally very like open-minded and cosmopolitan and know about the world, or at least they think they do. And that this is what made some of the interesting findings right so in the pretest, we had these five questions about that were empathy focused right <clears throat> and we found on the pretest, students were ranking you know basically either you know a one or two either com very complete agreement or very very strong agreement about having empathy right and so what happened on the post test was well of course there's no statistically there's no statistically, statistically significant differences in terms of the empathy they have towards afghans because they already reported such high late rates to begin with right <laughs> And other research has shown that this is a trend where, you know, students who, <clears throat> you know, think of themselves as cosmopolitan or globally aware are more, more likely to report higher levels of empathy, <clears throat> right? So, so this is a really striking finding because in some of, you know, in the interviews and stuff, I had a student saying, you know, at first saying she thought she had empathy, but then realizing, actually, no, I, uh -huh. I don't think I have empathy because they're so different from me. And so I realized, you know, part of my thinking is that, well, some of them, I think, came into the program thinking they had empathy but then realizing then that they really don't because they're different their their experiences are so different um and i think that there's some good quotations in there from students who did develop more empathy uh in a real tangible way as opposed to just kind of this label that they would hang on themselves i am globally empathetic but now they're able to get that in, in some of the narrative comments to be to articulate it and be specific about what that was and talk about how that's different from what they thought they were before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, exactly. Right. And that, that was, which is why I was so surprised when there weren't any statistically significant findings. And it took me so long to kind of figure out, it took us so long, right? Sorry. And I looking at it to figure out like, what is, 
what does this mean? How does this, how does this fit? How, how, you know, cause we saw, we thought we saw empathy and in the reflection papers and in some of the stories and in the experiences, we thought we saw it, but um, so anyway, yeah, that was fascinating. Yeah. Um, so the <laughs> um, lessons that you pull out of this um, and I, I encourage people to go look at the article about, uh, about how you would do it differently next time. So can you talk a little bit more about that? What you learned that you think if you were designing it today. Absolutely. Yeah. And especially now having taught a bunch of classes online, right. And having more experience and knowledge with that. Yeah. So <clears throat> another thing too, is we were actually hoping I, I was in touch with AUAF and we were hoping on doing a spring 22, like version of this at GW. But of course, because of the Taliban taking over, um, we had to put those plans aside. But when we were thinking about doing it again, you know, what I was thinking was, okay, you know, bare minimum, we noticed having, the one-on-one -on -one pairing is great, right, for these closer relationships, but there's also a lot of challenges, right? You know, if you have a student who loses access to internet um, or has a difficult schedule or something, then they can't get in touch with their partner, right? Um, we also realize there's kind of safety issues, you know, and sometimes people can be made to feel uncomfortable in one-on-one -on -one, in one -on -one conversations that are not being monitored. So um, one thing I've come away with is really thinking that the group should be at least, you know, two and two, right? Two from each side, which still allows for like a, a meaningful interaction, but kind of protects against some of the other issues, right? Um, and so, and of course, when we were doing this, we didn't really, breakout rooms were not really a common thing to, that were being used, right? And so I think if I was running this program now, what I would do is I would, I would ideally meet twice a week with the class. I would meet virtually, like with the Afghan and US students together with both instructors together and have like a joint session and then break on into breakout rooms with, you know, two Afghans and two Americans in each group and kind of have these ongoing groups. And then also maybe have them do group projects outside of it as well so that they're kind of having those interactions. Mm -hmm. um, and then I would also, uh, but then I would also meet once a week just in person physically with just the US students and have that encourage my counterpart in Afghanistan to do the same thing because then you have the separate time to debrief about what you're learning about the other culture um, and really deepen and that learning as well. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing that's kind of a, a um, challenge or something that I've been thinking a lot about, you know, is part of the, the the framing of this article has to do with, well, you know, when we're teaching conflict resolution, we have these students who want experience, you know, in conflict zones and with conflict affected individuals, right? And the way we usually do that is, you know, through simulations or through study abroad experiences. But then, of course, we can't, there's so many places we can't travel to, right? And so a program like this allows us to engage um, in these places, which we otherwise really can't engage with people who live there. Mm. Um, and so it's a really kind of exciting thing. But but when you run something like that, there's this larger question of like, okay, how ethical is this, right? And and mm. are we, you know, exploiting youth who are in these kinds of situations in facilitating these types of interactions? And I think that's always going to be a question. I think that's always going to be a challenge. But I think the, the, the most important kind of thing I've come away with from all the discussions I've had and from the experiences doing this program is really thinking about how do you your students, right, to make sure that they really are trying to learn from their counterparts and um, and trying to engage in meaningful ways. And then also really thinking like, you know, as an instructor about, okay, like, you know, how, how, how can we prepare instructors to make sure that there's kind of um, uh, just like really a lot of thoughtfulness in how this is designed and making sure that we're aware of, you know, what student situations are like in this context, mm -hmm. you know, what, and making sure it's not a burden on that right, that they're gaining at least equally to what our students are gaining from, from the interaction. Um, and I did really feel that in, in this program that students gained a lot, the Afghan students, right, really did get a lot out of it. I had a number of students who were like, if you ever do a program like this again, please, like, let me do this. You know, I'd love to be involved again. Yeah. Um, but there, you know, there were, you know, there, as I mentioned in the article, there was one who really felt that, you know, the program had wasted his time and exploited him. And, and I think that the challenge is that you have, you know, not all of the U.S. students are going to take it so seriously or really want to, and the same with not all the Afghan students, right? There were some yeah. US students who were like, you know, the, my Afghan partner really didn't want to talk to me. They just did what they had to and weren't interested in me. So this is always going to be a challenge. Um, and so I think I'm not really sure how best to mitigate that, but really yeah. just you know, encouraging the students to be sincere in their connections with the students to really respect the time of their peers. Yeah. And, and you know, and, and to say, hey, you know, like, let's get to, and let's get to know each other and let's try and keep these relationships going because I've found in in-person in in dialogue and exchange programs I've done as well that 
what I find often is I'll be talking to youth from these programs. And they've been like, oh, I haven't heard from this person. I haven't heard from this person. And then, and then the dialogue itself feels kind of cheap. It feels like it was this fake experience. Yeah. And it's so it's always a challenge, but um, somehow at least conveying to students like, hey, this is important. And then if you are going to engage with people, like think about how they're feeling and think about how to make time for them beyond the exchange. So. Which I, I think is, uh, I mean, that's a natural component of human interactions anyway. You're going to have people who are more interested or less or who get turned off by something that another person wouldn't get turned off by. And, mm -hmm. and that kind of sours the relationship a little bit. But, but I, I think that there's a way in which this is not just about cross-cultural communication, but it's about personal development of individuals as well, that it gets uh, into their understanding of what it means to interact with people who are diff very different and not so different. And I, I, uh, in some ways, I like that as a component of the two and two, because then it's not just the then there's a dynamic in which you're also interacting with somebody who is theoretically in this context at least not that different from you but you get to see that it's not the it might not be the afghan student who's causing the problem it might just be that that person's a jerk or or doesn't like getting a lot in this particular context or whatever you know complexifies it a little bit absolutely yeah and the whole the whole big thing or what's so interesting about these programs right is like how we think we're so different, but then we always find commonalities, right? And like, that's, you know, what we're trying to facilitate here. And I think if students can learn that, oh, hey, you know, there's this person, you know, on the other side of the world with a different religion from me, with who's different in so many ways, but wow, look at these interesting ways that we're connecting, right? And of course, we all know that that's, you know, any of us who have experienced that know that that's what like humanization is all about and seeing a mm -hmm. human like me, but there's something about experiencing it, right? That really just changes that, so. Alex, this has been a really interesting conversation because I, I think that there's ways in which people who are just teaching large intro to IR courses or global political economy or that, that there are ways in which they could take this idea, even though the learning objectives of that particular course that you were teaching were specifically about those mm. human interactions and, and kind of global contexts for humanity, there's ways in which this this uh, approach, this tactic could also be used to, to serve other learning objectives that may not seem at first blush like that they really connect to that very, uh, to, to, to those primary themes of a cross-cultural communications class. Yeah, and something really interesting that I came away with as well, you know, um, later on I, I submitted a proposal for a program with uh, like Egyptians and Americans to do this kind of thing and we didn't get it. Um, and one of the feedback we got from the, it's, it was the Stevens Initiative, they do, they do this all the time, right? And they gave really fantastic feedback, which was the program shouldn't just be focused on cross-cultural communication. It's usually focused on something else than cross-cultural communication, something that happens along the way, uh -huh. right? But to your point, it could be like, yeah, it could be, a, you know, any other, it could be a business course. There's various courses that students skills. And then in that way, right, you have your U.S. students and your students in, this, in another context who are really having a meaningful learning experience but also getting the cross-cultural piece. So it's like, it's really, you know, a win-win all around. So yeah, there's lots of creative ways to be doing this. Absolutely. I, I think that one of the things that we can just celebrate is that this is becoming more both feasible technologically mm -hmm. and commonplace in ways that there are people like you writing articles that can help everybody understand how they might actually implement this into one of their courses. So thanks, Alex. It's been a great conversation. I really appreciate you and your article and your co-author and bringing that to help us kind of think more about not innovative pedagogies that could happen in lots of different ways. Yeah, thanks so much, Jamie. This has been a really fun conversation and I appreciate you including me here. The Teaching Curve podcast is made available in the International Studies Association's Professional Resource Center and on its podcast page under the auspices of the Innovative Pedagogy Initiative. You can send feedback and suggestions for future interviews to teachingcurve at isonet.org and follow us on Twitter at teachingcurve. Or you can just find me at one of the many pedagogy themed panels at this year's ISA conference in Montreal. Thanks for joining us again on the teaching curve. And remember, learn something every time you teach. <laughs>